sort of um, notoriety or fame, if you will, where that started to, that demand started to come more from the district. Well, first, thank you. You, you flatter us by calling us notorious. That's great. Um, I hey. think, um, you know, that's a good question. Uh, our particular evolution might be a little unique in that way in that early on we were actually sort of coming with funding and so I still don't think right. we we're selling people like we created a little bit of a like hey if you want to work with us you should apply because we have resources to work with you um, and then later right. on sort of after we had proved our value in the marketplace um, I think then people like we haven't done aggressive like or, or even sales that way so I'm not, I'm not sure I think for other folks that there certainly is that and I think you know, there is still some level of like when we're out there meeting with people and we discuss who we are and what kind of work we can do. Um, I, I guess there's an element of, of sales to that. Got it. Right. It sounded like someone was about to jump in right right before that. Um, yeah, I don't know if that was Mark. Is Mark from New Classrooms. I so much of this resonates with me and in, in the work that we're doing. Um, the one uh, piece that you noted that we have flagged before is aligning with other partners in the school, but there's a, there's a broader piece of alignment that's constantly on my mind, uh, which is around just the continual alignment and realignment with schools and school leadership and district leadership, um, especially because of the evolving nature of many of those positions. I mean, one of the biggest challenges we've had is a uh, transition of leadership over time. Um, and what yeah. it looks like when a superintendent shifts, which we know happens every two to three years on average, and um, what happens when other key leadership roles shift, um, and what type of, uh, bench of champions do we need to have in different levels of the district organization or the school organization um, in order to uh, really keep the you know keep the alignment and keep the investment going um, even after the implementation has already started hmm. yeah that feels like a super important observation and I'm, I'm curious do you are you guys kind of identifying the same actor in different school systems that are the same actors that you're kind of building your bench with, or are you having to customize with kind of each district or, or school that you're entering? Yeah. Um, gosh, I wish we had really clear answers on all of these. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why these are valuable conversations. Um, right. <laughs> it's, a, it's a yes and a no on that one. Yes, there are some similarities. And so mm -hmm. we're that you know, we're in an innovation space and there are many districts that seem to be putting in place um, chief innovation officers or that type of space. Personalization is also a key buzz right now. And so there are many folks at district levels who are driving personalization efforts um, for the district. Um, those are key positions that we want to invest in for sure. Um, obviously superintendents, directionally speaking are key um, and we find that there's a really important mid-level that looks different in different districts um, but it's either deputy superintendents who may be managing principals or sometimes they're instructional superintendents and sometimes they have different titles uh, but there's that level that is somewhere between the superintendent in the clouds and the school leader and um, that if we don't have an alignment or investment there, um, things can really go a little bit wonky. Um, and so I guess what I'm finding is we need to really look at each of the organizations that we're partnering with, understand who the key players are, um, how, how power structures are aligned there, um, who has you know, the strongest voice or influence, um, and then, you know, make sure that we are understanding what their perspective are, is um, and how, you know, we align with that or misalign with that um, and start to, you know, address some of those questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a lot of sense. Um, are there any other things on, on this piece? Like, are there other ways that are missing or other things that really pop for folks? This is Lisa. Um, we often work in a more systems change capacity building framework. 
um, where we're trying to, on a variety of fronts, introduce something in a more conceptual and uh, district-wide level and um, facilitate uh, through implementation sciences and improvement sciences a systematic process for moving something mm -hmm. through the system. Yeah, that's really helpful. Great. Um, so I think we're, we'll transition. We have a bunch more questions for you all to, to dig in on, but we thought we would kind of kick things um, open with, with hearing more from City Connects and from New Classrooms about their approaches, um, and then dig into kind of sharing out and, and discussing some of the things that come up in their conversations and then that you all have in your own organization. So um, I can kick it over to, to the City Connects team to go first, if that makes sense. And then we'll, we'll hear from Mark right after that. Thank you. Um, thank you to Molly and Jody and everybody at New Profit for organizing this. Um, I'm Claire Foley and here with my colleague, Lynn Sullivan. We will spend about five minutes giving our approach and we thought, um, if we began with a couple sentences about what City Connects is, that might be helpful because uh, that shapes how we partner with schools. Um, our mission is to connect each and every student in a school with a specifically tailored set of services and supports um, that are aligned with that student's individual strengths and needs. And we go about that by having a coordinator, full-time coordinator in each school whose job it is to work with every classroom teacher every year, review every student's strengths and needs, and then design that tailored plan of supports. That requires an in-depth knowledge of, and, and an ongoingly refreshed knowledge of community partners and resources. Um, and it requires a lot of very close collaboration with teachers. Um, we, we begin our partnership with a, any school district whether they've reached out to us or whether um, we have in some way come across some contact from them um, and, and are initiating a contact with them um, through a needs assessment. You could really call it a needs and assets assessment. Our first and foremost goal is to listen to that district, listen to what they perceive as their needs and um, as their agenda, their priorities. We go about that through a process of um, listening that starts with district folks, but that specifically talks in every school with four groups of people. We talk with principals, teachers, families, and in the case of, um, if, it's a, if, it, if it's a high school, with students themselves, and then also finally with any partners the school's already working with. So that needs assessment process is a fairly in-depth process. It takes us a, a few months and we uh, conduct surveys of all four of those groups to try to come to a real understanding of the district's current needs and strengths um, in the area of supporting students, of supporting the whole child. That leads to um, a dialogue where we're able to share what we've learned back um, with folks from the district. Often we'll gather principals to share what we've learned. We try to share with as many people what we're hearing and um, talk about whether implementing City Connects makes sense. And when a district decides, yes, we'd like to move forward, we think this is going to be a helpful approach to student support, we would then enter a launch period in a, in a new school year. And so um, Lynn will tell us a little bit about the partnership with schools and districts um, in that launch and then into kind of the establishment, establishment of implementation. So once we um, have decided we're, um, we're um, going forward with the district and district side they're going forward with us um, typically they will choose which schools um, that we go into and we you know we give some dialogue about that oftentimes they've identified it ahead of time um, and we typically say um, you know at least six schools to have a good cohort um, of um, uh, work in City Connects and so what we offer is we have a hiring um, Kind of package that we offer. Typically, districts are hiring new positions um, for the City Connects coordinators, though we are starting to work with districts that are converting positions. And so um, we have a, a whole hiring process that we also offer to help with. Um, 
uh, right down to the questions, to the job description um, for both the coordinators and for the program manager, who's the person in the district that oversees um, the work of the coordinators. So um, that's a start. Once the um, positions are hired, um, what we do is we do training. Um, either the districts or the coordinators will come here uh, to Boston College where we're based, or we will go to them. And um, the, the training is led by um, our experienced team of program managers here who are based here in Boston, who are former coordinators themselves, as well as myself and our director of um, new practice, um, who is also one of our founders. Um, so the training is typically two days, two full days. Um, and then um, we also have a separate training that we do for program managers um, in both the practice um, and then in the oversight of um, monitoring and ma managing the program. And so um, once the training is done and the year has started, what we have is an ongoing um, support um, with the, uh, the leadership, the program manager. Uh, we have once a week calls with myself um, and with our director of new practice where we troubleshoot, um, discuss kind of the various um, aspects of implementation. Um, we're very cyclical in terms of the calendar, so we discuss where um, schools are doing in terms of that process. Um, of making sure that the um, assessments are done, um, the reviews are done on time. Um, and um, so that um, is typically um, the case. We also help as once districts are um, you know, fully implemented um, and typically after their first year and help them set goals. Uh, we have a big program manager meeting once a year where part of it is goal setting um, based on some of the metrics as well as their own work um, within the district. Um, so um, uh, what we um, you know, what we see from that is that we're both providing them coaching support, but also um, allowing them to kind of get through, especially in the first couple years, a lot of the questions and concerns that can come up, anything from um, the actual practice to working um, with the various partners in, in their district. Great, awesome. Thank you guys so much. I, one, one question that came up for me, as you all were sharing, if you don't mind, is actually related to Mark's earlier point. Because um, it sounds like it's, you know, the implementation, getting up and running in, in a district for you, you get a pretty robust set of schools that you're working with. Um, have you experienced a similar challenge that Mark brought up around transition of superintendents or of leadership? And how have you all dealt with that? Maybe we, maybe we both can say a couple words about that. Yes, Mark's right. And because City Connects is very much woven into the fabric of the school, we, we have found that after we are in a district for a couple of years, people in schools, school leaders, and even people at the district level start to speak our language and start to think about student support in the way that we have found over the years is highly effective. And so although Mark's right, and with a shift in superintendent, you never know, um, we do find that there, there's a shift in the sort of the way the schools do business that is is very helpful to us in weathering transitions. But Linda, do you want to add to that at all? I think where we see that um, the challenge is more often at the school level, um, where the if we if there's a new principal who comes in who may be completely unfamiliar with the model um, and they have a coordinator in there and, and are trying to figure out what his or her role is. So uh, what we um, typically do is working, the program managers themselves have a direct relationship with the school, um, but oftentimes we will tap into our district champion um, to, to help with that or we ourselves mm -hmm. will do our own um, induction um, for new principals. So um, I think Claire is right. Once we've been in a district for a while, we've kind of built up. It's more we see it at the school level and schools really kind of having a good understanding when there's turnover and change there about um, what, what City Connects is and what the coordinator is really doing in their school. Great. Super helpful. Thank you. Um, are there other questions or reactions to, to City Connect share and then we'll turn to the new classroom? All right, um, great. We'll turn it over to, to Mark. Mark, if you want to share a few words about new classrooms work and approach to partnering with schools. Sure, we'd be happy. 
22 action is going for the oh yeah you're chopping up a little bit Nope. are you all able to hear me okay uh you're kind of in and out a little bit all right uh well before <laughs> bummer how is it going right now molly oh yep i can hear you now okay great uh well hopefully that will stay that way um <laughs> yeah uh the oh, oh nope Lost you again, Mark. All right, so hopefully we'll get we'll get Mark back. Um, so um, the City Connect team and and the new classrooms team, uh, I had sent a few questions to them in advance of this session. If we get Mark back, we'll get his reaction to these questions. Um, but it sounded a little choppy there, so we'll see what happens. Um, but would love to just kind of open conversation and, and hear from you all and get, give you guys a chance to actually connect on these questions. Um, and maybe I'll take them in order and if the conversation flows a different direction, that's great. Um, but would love to hear from, from you all, like what challenges are you all encountering when you're working with schools and school districts? great news because then we can write yeah, no challenges. Uh, this is city we could we could name it um, we could name an issue that echoes something Andrew and Mark mentioned earlier. Um, they oh. pointing out that sometimes there are lots of partners and we have found that being in close touch with the principal, in close touch with our coordinator, and building into our practice an ongoing survey of community resources, an ongoing sort of scanning of what's in the area, uh, and, a, and a deep understanding of who's coming in and out of the building is really helpful to making sure that partners mm -hmm. aren't, you know, working independently toward the same end without knowing what each other's doing. City Connects is uniquely positioned to do this because of what our model is. We're in a school in part to serve as a facilitator of different partnerships. So, so our answer to this um, particular challenge might be a little different from what some other folks' answers might be. Mm -hmm. And this is Jody. I'd actually love to do just a little bit of a around the virtual room, if you will, to say because I mean we have mm -hmm. we have five organizations on the call. So it may be that you all um, are in the vanguard and have figured this out. So I guess my question would be, and Claire, thank you for your comment um, to the others. Is this a source of stress for you, or do you feel like this is an area that you've been you've been kind of walking on a learning journey, and you, you're in a pretty solid position? Um, and Molly, I'm, this is Mark. I'm back on the yeah. phone. I just wanted to let you know I'm like trying a different way. Sorry. Continue. <laughs> All right. Great. And Mark, maybe we'll just do this question and then kick it back to you. Yeah. Um, so big sure. picture, folks. Uh, the question to you all sounded. Sound um, Andrew, from your earlier comments, that you feel like you've you've kind of walked the path on on this one and, and kind of understand how to work with districts to get. Um, but I just want to give you another chance to weigh in. Hey, so this is Sarah. Andrew had to bow out, but I think yep. I, I could I would um, offer a few different things. First, I would say that um, in a lot of ways, big pictures kind of business model functions like a um, an early and very successful startup. Even though we're not a startup, we're 20 years old, we're kind of like trying to keep up with demand. Um, and so it, it is a bit of a different model. But part of that also has to do with our bandwidth, that um, the demand exceeds our capacity because demand is so great. So um, I think that built, that definitely built over time, and like Andrew spoke to the funding early on. Um, but I think also we're in a bit of a different situation with some of our new initiatives like in Blaze, where, um, where there's a bit more give and take and negotiation happening because in Blaze is a, is a, is a, a new initiative by us and a software that we're developing. And so there's a, there's kind of a give and take of what the district needs and what we need and the question of funding. Mm -hmm. yep. yep, that's great. 
And Lisa, what would you say on, on, on this front? I don't, I know you do a, you have a really broad book of work that you do with lots of different um, folks, including schools, but when you think about just the relationship with districts. Uh, yes, am I unmuted? Okay. Um, yes. So <laughs> there are lots of people, I'm not as directly involved with our, uh, on this, on the groundwork, but um, it's interesting. Uh, in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, the state departments of education have funded our work with districts. So they uh, have bought uh, an academy program on universal design for learning, which then they've provided to their neediest districts, the Title Three and Four districts. And uh, those districts then send teams out. And that starts the work, that starts the base level. And then there, uh, from that pool, people who have engaged with us for a year, then uh, there are districts that then want to fund a deeper initiative. And uh, then we uh, have a team of folks that we call our implementation team, and they go out and they work directly with that district on a deeper implementation of the framework. Um, so that, that's been our experience. Uh, we've had the same struggles most organizations have had with, uh, you may have a champion, who's brought the initiative into the school or district and uh, then they're not there anymore and the will is lessened, potentially. Um, so that's why we try to get buy-in at multiple levels of the district. Um, and uh, I think that's it for now. Great. Um, and I, how about um, Courtney from, from Power My Learning? What are, what are you all experiencing on this? Um, hello, um, can y'all hear me? Yeah. Cool. So uh, as we are, um, we've worked primarily with schools individually up until recently when we're kind of expanding our work with the districts. Um, and we've experienced some of the challenges that others have mentioned primarily about, um, when, you know, advocates or champions transition out and then kind of like rebuilding that uh, advocacy. Um, I think another thing that we're, we've seen is, um, you know, finding, I guess, it's, I guess I would categorize it as like finding the right partner with the right fit. You know, some districts have, have a few initiatives already existing. And so it's really finding like where our work aligns well without, um, you know, without forcing or, um, or, or overlapping, you know, overlap is okay, but you know, just making sure that we could find the right fit with all of the partners or initiatives that a district currently has going on um, without completely, um, you know, customizing everything that we offer. Great. Um, and, and I think, Mark, I, I know you've had a chance to think a little bit about, about this question as well as the others, so if you want to reflect on this question and then um, go ahead and share a bit more about your approach as you were going to right before right before we lost sure. it. Sure. <laughs> Sorry about that. Can you reframe no the original no question um, here, Molly, as well? I think I missed that as I was trying to get back on. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we were saying, you know, kind of what are what are the challenges you've encountered in working with school districts? And mm -hmm. um, to some extent, maybe maybe you've actually already walked a bit of a, a path on this, so you could be kind of farther mm -hmm. along or. Sure. The challenges walk through, um, but yeah. yeah, kind of where we were yeah. at. Yeah, I think that's I think that's fair. If it's if it's okay, maybe I'll just talk a little bit about yeah. how we approach partnerships because I think um, it reflects some of those challenges in particular. Um, I think what I was starting to say before is, you know, from a vision perspective, we are we're focused on reimagining learning, um, and that's rethinking the classroom and trying to do things in a different way. Um, and at many levels are intentionally disruptive. Um, so just by the nature of that, um, we can be uh, an exciting and a challenging partner for schools and districts. <laughs> um, and I think what we have learned over time is that it's really important for, um, for leaders throughout the system, as I was describing, to really be aligned with what that what comes with the type of innovation that we're bringing to the table and the type of disruption that we're bringing to the table, um, because um, otherwise it can be really difficult to stomach. Um, and some of the ways that our model 
pushes schools um, really come in like direct opposition to some of the accountability structures of the school or some of the other preferences that, that folks in leadership positions may have. Um, so that's really an important thing that we've learned over time. Um, from a partnership perspective, we, we think about partnership from first contact with districts. Um, and so our growth and expansion team, which is essentially like quote unquote sales, um, they begin with our vision of what a healthy implementation looks like um, in a school. Um, and we've sort of backed that out in an attempt to develop uh, readiness criteria for district partnerships and school partnerships so that we have at least some understanding of what needs to be true um, in order for these pieces to be successful. Um, and so we really spend a lot of time, our, our timeline from first contact to signing a contract or like really making a green light decision um, is anywhere from 12 to 18 months, which is a really long time. Um, and during that time, we are providing a ton of information about what we know, uh, you know, have been important pieces for a district and a school to consider. And we're also providing the schools and the districts to get a lot of information about the model um, and make sure that it's aligned with where they want to head um, and thinking about um, what it would look like to, to implement this. Um, once we once we actually decide to move forward with um, with a district or school partner, um, then we we actually have a lot of support within our model in order to help maintain the alignment and just support the implementation, um, which I think is a unique aspect of of our model. Um, when you think of it as a curricular program, we are essentially taking over the math program uh, for any of the schools that partner with us and providing personalized schedules for students and teachers every single day. Um, and it involves a lot of change management um, on, on the part of the teachers and the school leaders and the district to some level. Um, so we actually have three different supports um, that work with every, um, every school. Um, that's someone on my team, the partnerships team, who's thinking about the account as a whole and managing the health of the district relationship and the school relationship. We have an instructional coach that's assigned to each school. They typically have about four schools in their portfolio that they work with and provide instructional guidance to teachers and to math directors and school leaders in order to help them uh, manage through the change that's involved there. And then we have operational support. And um, because our program is so heavy on technology, um, it, it, it's sometimes a little bit difficult for schools uh, to get their minds around that. So we have an operations manager who works with a cluster of six to seven schools. Um, and then often we have uh, an associate level on site at every school every day um, for you know two to four hours, depending upon what the needs are there. Um, and it's a it's a big investment on our part. It's a big investment on the district's part for sure. Um, but we found that it's critical, especially at the beginning of a partnership, in order to support schools and districts through that change. Um, and then just you know at the at the highest level, as I was saying a little bit earlier, we're really just constantly um, reassessing the quality of the implementation and not only thinking about what it's going to take to drive the implementation forward. Um, but then thinking about that uh, within the broader framework of the district, making sure that uh, we have the right people uh, aligned and supporting what's going on. And if there are misalignments, making sure that we're putting those questions on the table so that we can grapple with them, making sure that folks understand how the implementation is going um, and what the results are of the implementation to, to, at various points. Um, and then, you know, another big factor for us is financial sustainability, um, really making sure that um, we have a pathway for the district to sustain the implementation over time, um, which is another major factor for us. Um, being a technology heavy startup, um, we have been working to get our costs down, but they still end up being quite high, which means that the fees for schools um, are often on the higher end for them um, and can be a major blocker to initial or ongoing partnership. 
Um, so really making sure that we're keeping an eye on that financial sustainability question, um, naming that for all of the key stakeholders and engaging in any problem solving that's necessary in order to move that forward. Um, it's really, my team is only about a year and a half old right now. Um, so this idea of how we're thinking about partnerships and bringing some of these pieces together is still relatively new. Um, but I, you know, I think we found that it's adding a lot of value in terms of our ability not only to make the implementation stronger and achieve greater success, uh, but also to uh, renewing our existing partnerships um, and, you know, really driving, you know, satisfaction and results across the board. That's great. Thanks, Mark. I, one question I had, Mark, I wonder if you could maybe sure. see another level of detail to, is actually like how you you guys came to the readiness criteria that you have in place. What was kind of your, your process or what led you to say like, actually we really need to, to take this step? <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> it is, it's, I wouldn't say that we have really strong readiness criteria right now, but we're figuring it out. Um, yeah. I, you know, I think we are just coming up against some partners who over time um, were really falling out of alignment um, for for reasons that, you know, we, we didn't project on the front end. So a couple of examples. Um, you know, some schools are find our model to be appealing when they have a struggling school population or students who are performing below grade level. The notion that they could have a personalized curriculum that would meet those kids where they are is compelling. Um, and it's certainly part of you know, why we do what we do. Um, some of those schools may also be dealing with broader turnaround questions um, and questions of school culture or um, where you know, they're, they don't have the basics in place to help with students to engage. As we've just found is that implementing Teach to One takes a level of sophistication and energy. Um, and when a school is in some crisis around culture, uh, often not a time when they can also take on this type of innovative uh, curricular initiative. Um, and actually put in the effort that it would take in order to make it successful. Um, and so in those types of situations, we found, gosh, teachers are overwhelmed for a variety of other reasons outside of implementing this model. And then when we put this on their plate as well, um, they're not able to engage in it in the way that it would take in order for it to be successful. And then it just increases the frustration um, and then often ends up being pointed toward the model as being the problem, um, which you know is completely fair. And so that's an example of one of the pieces that we look at going into a school is just where the culture is and you know whether or not they have the capacity um, and are at a state where it actually makes sense to take this type of step. Um, I you know I think we we've learned different at a district level and at a school level that help us to keep track of like the overall health of those different pieces. Um, and what we now do is we sort of backwards plan from that. So those are the metrics that we use to manage the implementations ongoing. Um, and we've worked back through the pipeline to think about in terms of our understanding of those different metrics and to what degree we would need to understand them. So, you know, at initial contact, we're just gathering some basic information. As we get a little bit deeper and go into what we call pre-vetting, um, we're getting a little bit deeper and gathering some more context and information. We then have a process that we call full vetting, where we actually go in and fully assess um, our perspective on the quality of instruction, um, the stability of the leadership, the school culture, and their operational readiness on different pieces, the financial state of the district, and just the broader philanthropic environment in order to drive that. Um, and all of that goes into our overall assessment as to whether or not we actually move forward with partnerships. Um, and we're trying now to better align that all the way through so that as our as our sales folks are actually driving things forward, they're doing so with that end vision in mind. Yeah, 
That's super, super helpful. Thanks, Mark. I have a question. Sure. This is Claire at City Connects. I think that's so interesting, Mark. The other people on the call from Big Picture Learning or Palmer Learning or anybody else on the call, what's the range of time that different uh, organizations mm -hmm. find themselves? Um, what, what's the range of timelines? You know, ours is like four months, except it's kind of six months because then you have a summer before we would start implementing. Whereas Mark's is, Going, but I'm just curious what others' timeline is and what some of the steps are involved in others' planning and pre-work with districts. Uh, this is Courtney from Power My Learning. Um, as I said, we're kind of transitioning to more uh, district work, um, but at in like our cohorts of schools, for example, it could range from six months. quickly with like a, a, a little pilot or um, a trial of services. Let's say in the next school year, we could do a, you know, a mini partnership in the spring to kind of give a taste or a flavor or get, get on board. Um, we might work with a small group of teachers first, either during the end of the school year or during the summer. So sometimes that's a part of our, of our, of our timeline is like kind of a, a mini, like a little bit of work um, in the, in the months leading up to the full partnership. Um, and you've seen that actually be very successful contextual contextual information that district level um, that's different um, that experience at the district level I think um, it might be beneficial as well if it's available. Yeah, Sarah, if you wanted to jump in on that. Sarah, you on mute? Did that address you? Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Great. Um, any other questions or, or reactions to, to the pieces that Mark? Question um, for Mark, but maybe more generally. So one of the things that I observed um, is that there may be a point um, where you've developed a bunch of relationships with districts and then you know enough to start to put in place uh, readiness criteria or mm -hmm. filter, if you will. And you recognize that not all of the partners that you are working with are actually of equal value um, or likely to get you to, to the same right. desired impact target. I'm curious if anyone has struggled with that and actually had to back away from any district partnerships once you've gotten enough information to have a, a filter or um, a rubric in place. Does the question make sense? Anyone, anyone gotten there? You know, this is Sarah. Sorry, I couldn't get to the mute quickly enough last time. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I'm not involved in that aspect of the work enough to speak in depth to this, but I will say that um, we're very careful up front um, and because of where we are as an organization to like, we've learned that there are certain situations we won't go into. Um, and on the other hand, I will, you know, in the in the safety of this room, offer our vulnerability that sometimes it's driven by funding. That if we have the funding for the project, or the district has the funding for the project, then we can, or the partnership, <coughs> we can go forward. And and if we don't, we can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. This is Mark. I uh, the funding piece makes total sense. We haven't. We have not been in a place where we've actively removed ourselves from any partnerships exclusively from our end. We have made, uh, we've made joint decisions with partners to remove Teach to One from particular schools and districts have made decisions to remove Teach to One for a number of reasons. 
Um, but it is a question that's on our mind for sure. And we don't have anything formally in place. So all of our sort of evaluation criteria are internal right now. Um, but we have been tossing around the idea of a credentialing type of system um, that would help us to validate the different types of impl implementations that we have out in the world. Um, and in doing that, help us to think about our own evaluation of the effectiveness of the program. Because one of the major things that we are trying to figure out is, gosh, we're, we share accountability with our partners and we have to report against the results. And yet we look across the network and can see a variety of different factors affecting the implementation that we don't have direct control over. Um, and so that's one of the things that we've been thinking about a lot, not necessarily just to have a strategy to, you know, remove the implementation if it's really poor, um, but something that helps us to think about evaluation as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's really helpful. Um, so, oh, is someone going to hop in there? Um, so I know we've got we've got a set of questions up on on the screen, but really these are just to jog. I'm curious, you know, if there's any direction or something that really brought people to this conversation. What are you really looking for? What are your curiosities? And I think we can follow those those avenues um, to to whatever extent you'd like. And um, you know, this is an experiment doing this conversation based or discussion based webinar, and and um, we don't know what experience people will bring or where you all are at. So we want to be reactive to that and, and see where you all want to go. This is Courtney. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, as I mentioned, I'm, we're, I'm, I'm, as you may have gathered, I'm interested in the second bullet, um, the, learning about other successful strategies. Um, and also wanted to say that I really appreciate the format. Definitely one of the more engaging webinars I've been on in the past couple of years. <laughs> Courtney, what I, this is Jody from Reimagine Learning. What I was just about to say um, is we are actually experimenting with a couple of different formats, and this is the first time we've done a format that is purely discussion based and on a topic that was surfaced from our our grantees. So I think the thing that might be unfortunate is actually the timing so close to the holidays means yeah. that very few people were able to show up. Um, so one thing we may consider is just putting it out to the network to see if they'd be interested in re-engaging on this topic in the new year right. when um, book schedules are a little bit more um, less crammed because I know we had nearly everyone express interest in this topic. Right. Um, so that's just something something I think we'll we'll think about on our side. But to Molly's point, is there any direction that would be helpful? I mean, so you kind of have a little focus group of your peers. So if there's something you're wrestling with, real real time, I think you should feel free to put it out there and see what folks might suggest tactically. Anyone want to take advantage of this? Well, here's a question just following up on something Courtney just said. This is Claire at City Connects. Um, in terms of strategies, one strategy that we've used pretty deliberately is to never be without the consultation and wisdom of people who have been in schools, who have worked in schools, either for their whole career or for you know big chunks of their career. And those um, have included principals, um, principal cluster leaders, teachers. We've had multiple folks who were, you know, previously teachers. Um, and then, although not, ex you know, strictly speaking in schools, people who have spent years working with community partners that, that work with kids in schools. And I know that in the, the groups on this call, there are a lot of people who are former teachers or who have former, you know, who have experienced themselves in schools. But my question is, have, has anyone come up with good strategies for cultivating those relationships with school district experts? Sounds like a great question. You've got a stump. Got to, yep. <laughs> uh, we have a, um, we have a, uh, we've experimented with panels in the past or task force groups of experts in the field and experts, um, including experts in the field and, you know, um, school leaders, teachers, uh, folks that have been in the field for a long time. And we found that people really enjoy participating, even if it's on their own time and sharing their expertise and providing feedback on, on, on really everything from product to partnerships. Um, so I'm not sure if that's helpful or not, but we've, we've, 
we've experimented with that and found it quite successful. Um, folks are kind of naturally engaged. We don't really have to spend a lot of effort on engagement. Um, people are, maybe it's proper selection, but folks are really happy to share. Yeah, that, that's a wonderful idea. Panels are a good idea. Yeah. Um, and actually, one, this is Molly. One, one thing that um, this actually came up in the October working session, for those of you who are there, one of the groups was talking a little bit about bullet three. So how do they actually build kind of um, schools or school districts who would will, be willing to be innovation partners with them, willing to let them try kind of new experiments with their model in those school districts? Um, and one of the recommendations that came up that I think was pretty interesting and, and the organization might try to test is actually like building a superintendent's advisory council or principal's advisory council to actually like give real time market feedback a few times throughout the year while also building buy in of those actors for the innovations that this um, organization was hoping to test out. Um, so, so that's not an, an active strategy that's in place that I know of with any of the organizations in our portfolio, but it's something that um, was people are, are thinking of trying out, which I think could be really interesting. That's a really neat idea. Has anyone had success in um, gathering principal or superintendent input? Because we've tried and we've just found that principals are so busy, it's really hard to get a group of them to be able to come in person all at the same time. Um, and we haven't, maybe we, maybe we could think about using technology or other strategies. Has anyone been successful in convening principals? Uh, this is Sarah. You know, honestly, I was only successful convening principals when I was in a funding role and told them they had to. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Although once they were gathered, like folks were very, very interested in connecting more and had lots of ideas, particularly around using technology to do so. Like school print, like I had this cohort of 20 uh, school principals in an urban district that like they were, every time we got together, they said, how can we connect um, using technology? How can we do this? And they, they, they really wanted that. So maybe that's a good possibility. Yeah. One of, one of the, this is this is Mark with new classrooms. One of the things that I've tried to do is leverage um, key influencers within districts or schools um, who have who are invested in what we're trying to do and try to lean on them to figure out forums to bring people together. So I've definitely had some uh, instructional superintendents who have standing meetings with principals um, who would have an investment in the type of work that we're doing. Um, who would say, I'm happy to like engage in this conversation when we're already gathering the principles or leveraging some of those types of forums that already exist, um, or just having someone who has some influence um, to kind of put it out there to their peers um, in order to kind of bring them together. So it's not necessarily the ask just coming from us, but it's actually coming from people that they know or people who have some influence over them. That's a wonderful idea. Thank you. Yeah. Any other avenues people would like to pursue or, or in this vein strategies people would like to go ahead and share? All right. Great. Um, so, so unless someone wants to pipe up, I think we, we can go ahead and, and wrap this early. And as Jody mentioned, um, this is you know an exciting experiment. We've had a number of virtual learning sessions um, throughout this year. I think we've had about um, five in total throughout the course of this year, and I know many of you have have joined them. Um, so, always interested in in your feedback and in what topics will really be interesting, in what format. Um, is it kind of just like a presentation? Is it discussion based like this? What makes the most sense? Um, really would love to, to get your thinking on, on that. Um, and in the, the vein of experimentation, we do want to um, announce what our, our planning for 2017. We will have two um, active webinar virtual learning series 
um, going on throughout the year. So one is the Voices from the Field series, and this is going to be open to the full Reimagine Learning Network. So, you know, the 400 plus members of the Reimagine Learning Network, and we'll be highlighting kind of uh, unique voices in the field or, or preeminent thinkers in the field around key topics. Um, so the first, that'll be taking place on a monthly basis, um, and we're looking to kind of touch on topics that, that are, are relevant for any actor in the Reimagine Learning Network, whether they be a social entrepreneur, policymaker, uh, thought leader, anything like that, family member, teacher, system leader. Um, those will be taking place monthly, the second Tuesday of the month from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern. And the first session of um, 2017 is actually a session that we're reprising from 2016 because uh, social entrepreneurs had the opportunity to, to hear from Bob Cunningham do kind of a, a learning differences, learning and attention issues 101 session. And we got really positive feedback from, from social entrepreneurs. So if you weren't able to join that or others from your organization weren't able to join, we'll have that session on January 10th from 3 to 4 p.m. with Bob. Um, and then we're going to continue to do a monthly session just for social entrepreneurs, so just for our grantees and other organizations that we've connected with deeply who are social entrepreneur-led organizations. And these are more conversations like this or are really oriented towards challenges you're facing in, in your organizational growth or in your programming um, that you'd like to kind of get some additional content on or have a deeper conversation on. Um, so those will be taking place the fourth Tuesday of the month from 3 to 4 p.m., uh, so lots of opportunities for this group to, to convene, um, and as you can see on the screen here, any recommendations, we're really open to, to whatever feels right for you all, and if you have things that you'd actually like to present to the network, um, we would love to, to feature your, your presentation as a, as a webinar, either in the Voices from the Field or the Social Entrepreneur Series. Um, really excited about that. Um, I would just add one one thing to the um, the social entrepreneur series, which was we've recently done a couple of fishbowls on targeted topics that um, an, org an organization might surface us, and then we'll reach out and get a couple of other organizations and a couple of experts from our network to lean in and have a session with an organization to help them get a number of different perspectives on a topic that they're really wrestling with internally. And these have been really, really um, helpful. So if that's something that would be of interest, just reach out to Molly and let us know. Yeah, yep. And I have to give Sarah a shout out for for joining one of those already this week. It's always a pleasure to hear Sarah's voice on the phone from Denver. Um, feel like we get to be together a fair amount, which is great. Um, so, um, thank you all so so much for joining. Really appreciate it. Particular shout out to to Mark and to the City Connect team for joining um, and sharing your perspective. Um, and we will talk to all of you very soon in the new year. Hope you all have a great break. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.